After playing TFT for the past five years, I've compiled over 100 TFT tips for set 12. This is going to include charm, trait, portal, augment, and champion tips, along with the beginner, intermediate, and advanced section as well. These tips are going to focus more on set specific mechanics. So if you're looking to dive into TFT during set 12, this is going to be a must watch for most players. Of course, if you want to just focus on charms, for example, you could go ahead and just skip to that section down in the chapters below. We're going to start off with the beginner tips. I have three quick ones for you today. The first one is going to be that in set 12, they're introducing bag size changes for one, two, and three cost units. And this could be a lot to comprehend, but to make it easier for all you filthy degenerates out there, including yours truly, when bag sizes increase, it makes it easier to reroll all these champions. So rerolls back on the menu for set 12 for one, two, and three cost units. Next, I want to talk to you about splash units. Splash units are units that can be put into any team comp or maybe used to activate a two trade bonus. Typically, the best splash units are ones that have some sort of utility such as a stun. For example, Elise as a one cost is a better splash unit than Jace for shapeshifters because she has a stun and Jace does not. She might even be better than a two or three cost shapeshifter due to her effect. Of course, you'd rather splash in more expensive units such as like a Morgana, a Zerath, and things like that, but I just want to use utility as one example. Then, just like the movie Sixth Sense, there are six status or utility effects in TFT. They are Burn or Wound, Shred, Sunder, Stuns, Mana Reeve, and Chill. Some of these you may only need one of, such as Burn, Shred, and Sunder, but for others, it can be useful to have multiple. Here's how to get all of them in set 12. You can get burn effects from Rumble, Katarina, Dragon Trait, Sunfire Sorcery, Blistering Strikes, Sunfire Cape, Morello Namicon, and also the Eternal Flame, just like when you're playing jungler in League of Legends. Next, we have Shredding, like when you go to the gym, but except this is for magic resistance reduction. Syndra gives this, Final Resistance gives this, Dress Down, Ionic Spark, Static Shiv, and Black Cleaver. Sunder, pretty similar, except this is for armor reduction, that's gonna be Twitch, Final Resistance, Dress Down, Last Whisper, Even Shroud, and Black Cleaver. Next up, we have stuns. There are quite a few of these, but Elise, Galio, Shivana, Tristana, Zillion, Nico, Nami, Tom Kench, Briar, Camille, Eldritch, Eight Witchcraft, Aftershock, Earthquake, Crash Test Dummies, Eternal Winter, and I'm probably missing a couple others. These all give nice stun effects. You could have almost unlimited of these, whereas for the Burn, Shred, and Sunder, you typically only need one source of it. What I like to do if I do have multiple of these though is to kind of spread out the love a little bit. So if you're running a bunch of units that do have stun effects, you might want to spread them out so they don't overlap, but oftentimes they don't. Next up we have is Mana Reeve. You really only get this from Shroud of Stillness. There are sometimes some units that give this, but I did not see any in this set. And lastly, for the sixth one, we've been through a lot already. Let's just chill a little bit. And we could do that through playing Diana, Nunu, or having Eternal Winter, the item. Now let's move on to charms. Charms are a new mechanic in TFT, and it's also a pretty important aspect in life. I did not select the right charm in my IRL dating sim, so I am currently single. In TFT though, charms can show up in your shop until you buy one of them, and then they kind of disappear for that round. So if you do plan on rolling a lot during a round, make sure to buy a useful charm as early as you can so it doesn't waste one of your reroll slots. The next thing you should know about charms is that they are separated by tiers. And just like your biological stepdad, they show up at different stages in your life. Some show up at stages two to three, some at three to four, some at three to five, and some only do it for stages four and above and five and above. There's also Magnum Opus, which shows up even later, and Zerath Charms, which you activate by playing your Zerath. Try to pick your charms as quickly as possible, as many of them can take a long time to use, so be careful not to run out of time. For example, one of them gives you all the one cost units on your board, all 15 of them, and you have to like run through in a semicircle to kind of collect them all and it's quite a time consuming process. So if you're a boomer like me and can't pick your charms quick enough, do note that charms that are bought during combat are applied to the next round if they are a combat charm, such as something that gives you an attack buff. But if they are non-combat charms, they generally apply right away. Before using any of your reroll your shop to X cost charms, make sure you buy whatever's in your current shop first because they will disappear after you click that button. Also, did you know that you could scout your opponent's charms by clicking on their icons on the right hand side? I know you won't actually do this because no one scouts, but it is useful to know. The charm Zoomify is great for melee comps. This one gives a ton of movement speed for your team, but it doesn't really do too much for range comps as the stats don't really benefit them as much. 
So just because something might sound good doesn't mean it actually is. It really depends on your team comp. Speaking of team comps, did you know that you could get the latest team comps on bunnymuffins.lol slash meta? I heard it's updated every single Friday. Back to charms though. Charms are kind of like conversations on Tinder. Most only last for one round. And obviously, if you are loose streaking, you should probably skip the charm if you think the fight will be close. But many of the combat charms in TFT are pretty short term. Alternatively, if you are win streaking, it might behoove you to roll for a charm instead. Now let's go on into the fun charms. We have Conjure Emblem, which gives you a random emblem. And this one might be a little tempting to take because everyone loves emblems. They're fun, they're great, they're fantastic. But if you actually look at how much it costs, it costs 15 gold to get a random emblem. And if you are hard forcing a comp, you definitely don't want to take this. Only take this if you are actually flexing your team. The same goes for Conjure Spatula, which costs 15 gold as well. And this is a ton for one component. Essentially, components are generally 8 gold if you compare it to Conjure Anvil. So you should really only take this 15 gold spatula if you really, really, really need a plus one of a trait. Typically, if you're going for like a nine or 10 trait, that's the only time I would probably take it because it just costs so much gold. Apart from these two examples, charms actually are well worth their money and some are easy to figure out. For example, assembly, which we talked about before, gives you 15 gold for 10 gold. And if you need the unit, that's even better. But stuff like minor mimicry gives you a lesser duplicator for five gold, which is often well worth it. Since it costs five gold and duplicate can give you a three cost champion. It essentially means if you rolled once and found the exact champion you want and that only costs five gold, that is well, well worth it. You could easily stabilize a lot of boards that way or use it to get a three star, three cost champion. But even if you're not re-rolling, it's worth it just to stabilize in most games. Bunch of belts may seem a bit useless. It gives you six belts, especially if you have a gamer waistline like mine. Actually, it depends. Some gamer waistlines really need all six belts, some don't. But it is actually great for teams that utilize components really well, such as Sugarcraft. Next, I want to talk about Minor Polymorph. This is a very interesting charm because if you took an augment such as Build a Bud, where you get a three star one cost early on in the game, you can actually sell all your other one costs and then take Minor Polymorph to turn that Build a Bud into a two cost three star unit, which is absolutely incredibly powerful. For all the polymorph charms, it is random which unit it hits, so you can always manipulate your board by selling or buying units of the same cost to decrease or increase odds of whatever outcome you want. The next thing to know about charms is that, unlike champions, they are not in pools. Champions exist in a shared pool in TFT, but everyone can use the same charms. Just like how everyone in dating can use the same types of charms, but if the unit you're looking for is taken, they're already out of the pool. Okay, the last joke was overdoing it a little bit. I'll keep this one in the video, but I promise that's the last charm dating joke. I kind of tricked you because we're leaning towards the later part of the charm section. So in the late game, charms are really, really powerful, especially all the combat ones. Stuff like Desperate Plea, which allows you to not die even if you die, is incredibly good. Buy it at the last second so no one knows that you have it. Conversely, you could actually kind of scout around and see how much gold people have to see if they can even afford it. Next, I want to talk about the Elder Dragon charm. This augment is incredibly powerful. It's probably one of the better late game charms, but I think people are misusing it. It's a giant dragon, so people think they should put it on the front line, but it actually has two range and it does a lot of damage. So don't just put it in the front line. It's still going to be tanky, but you want it to just hit people a lot before it actually starts taking damage. So put it in like the third or maybe even the fourth row. Now let's talk about traits. If your carries are being one-shot by backline abilities, consider adding Bastion to increase their resistances. It's a team-wide buff. Warriors are cool too, and many warriors actually have jumping abilities, meaning that they could easily access backlines in some cases. So if you see an opponent going warriors, you do have to be a little careful when you're scouting. Next, I want you to play Druid whenever you want, but it's especially powerful in the mid game. It works best when you have a team that has like a very easy five champ comp in the early to mid game, but maybe nothing great to add at level six. In those cases, you probably want to play a Wukong. Some comps have a great six champ comp but not a great seven. Again, you wanna be playing Wukong in those cases. Also, even if you do have an easy five champ comp, but you don't have all the five champions that you need, what should you play? Right to jail, right away. You're driving too fast, jail. Again, probably Wukong can fit that slot. Overall, just a very solid champion. Fairies are a little tricky too. Normally, you want to put items on upgraded units, but I see some people playing and they put the Queen's Crown that you get from the Fairy Augment on their Lilia in the early game. And I think this is a decently big mistake because Queen's Crown gives damage amplification, which means you should really only put it on your damage dealers. However, the armor that you get at six Fairy is pretty useful on a tank. Pyros are a bit tricky too. 
They gain attack speed for your team on kill, and they also have a built-in execute. This means you should try to make your pyros your damage dealers whenever possible, and you might want to spread them out a little bit so that they are able to get their damage instances on everyone on the map. That setup would work best in an AoE comp. However, if you're doing a single target comp, you could keep them all together so that they focus fire and kill a unit one by one. Sugarcraft is a very fun trait for gambling addicts, but you really should only be using this on item portals where you get a ton more extra items so that you get more sugar craft procs, or if you get an early sugar craft emblem. This makes the trait infinitely better. Witchcraft units apply curses when casting their ability, and it also spreads on death. So what you want to do when you're playing witchcraft is to spread out your units, but keep your damage dealers together to focus down targets to apply the spread. Now for blasting. I started blasting. Blaster units gain damage amp after every cast, but since some of them rely on their abilities for damage rather than their auto attacks, such as Hui, make sure you equip them with mana regeneration items and attack speed items so that they get that damage amp on their next cast. Hunters are great because they have a hero power that deals 2 damage to the enemy you- Oh wait a minute, that's the wrong game. In TFT, they gain attack damage and reset after their first takedown. So what you should do whenever you're playing Hunters is to scout your opponents to find their weakest tank and focus it down with all your Hunters. Encanters love getting stacks, so naturally, stacking items on them are great to get them to auto attack and cast faster, such as Rageblade. Probably one of the better encanter items out there, especially on Cassiopeia. The 2 encanter buff is also a great splash trait since it gives 10 AP to your whole team. On hit effects have been greatly reduced throughout the history of TFT, but multi strikers and your mom's slippers make great use of these effects, so getting an item like Wit's End is absolutely incredible when playing multi strikers. Scholars have built in Spear of Shojin based on their trait, so don't build more Spear of Shojins on your scholar, it's redundant. Build ability power on them instead. Shapeshifters are one of the tank traits in this set, and they make fantastic tanks. Their trait bonus is also based on health. However, it could be tricky to itemize these shapeshifters. Normally when people see, oh you get a bonus based on a certain stat, they start stacking that stat. However, I'm going to say that this is a minor mistake. You should actually not neglect resistances on your shapeshifters because of how effective HP calculations work. If you put something like a stone plate on your shapeshifters, they end up being really really tanky with all the bonus health that they already get. Speaking of shapeshifters getting bonus health, in order to do that they need to cast their ability, so make sure that they don't die before they get that cast off. Oftentimes, if you're doing a secondary tank as a shapeshifter, or maybe if they have no items, you might want to put them in the second row so that they can cast and get their bonus HP. Vanguards kind of work in the opposite way. They gain durability when shielded, however you do not need to overly stack shields on them since they already gain a shield at the start of combat and at 50% health. Therefore, stuff like Crown Guard, while it's still good as a tank item, isn't completely necessary on Vanguards because they already get a shield effect at the start of the round. However, an item like Bloodthirster is pretty useful on a Vanguard because it triggers at 40% health, which gives them bonus damage amp at a period that they typically wouldn't have it. Mages are back in TFT, and one thing if people have learned from previous sets is that mages are really really weak without the mage trait because they're literally balanced around it. So that means they make horrible splash units. The best example is Nami, where she gains a bonus effect every three casts. So if you're not running Mage and you're running Nami, she essentially is working at like half power, which means you probably shouldn't be playing her at all, or you have to find a way to add in Mages. Next, let's talk about Chrono. They have a countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7. Apparently, if I was an otherworldly attractive person, I could actually charge you $20 for saying that. But in TFT, Chronos gain a bonus after 16 seconds, and it's sped up by 1 second after each Chrono ability cast. That means you should absolutely get as many mana effects as possible, such as Spear Shojin, or making one of your Chronos a mage unit. Now onto portals. Portals are a bit of an old mechanic, but there are important things to kind of know. For example, people always ask me what are high econ portals versus a low resource one whenever I talk about them in one of my other videos. Stuff like being born into generational wealth like Crab Rave or Scuttle Puddle are high econ as they give a ton of gold and extra loot. Low resource portals like being born in the 1930s could be something like Golden Prelude, Golden Finale, or even Anvil Buffet. High econ portals are great for teams that are expensive or use multiple carries. Low resource portals are great for cheaper comps such as vertical comps or a comp that only cares about one or two units. 
Next tip is on Trainer Sentinels, Arcana Tom Kench's effect is really effective because you just get a ton of extra traits. So if you never know what to put in whenever you're playing Trainer Sentinels or you have a random plus one, play some Arcana Kench. Treasure Golems are great. They're pretty fun, uh, but one thing to do with the treasure golem is to always solo frontline the treasure golem in the early game. That way you get the treasure a bit faster. Later on, you could even play around with it more by sacrificing your like useless units so that the item goes on better units after the golem dies. Now onto augments. Augments are still a very critical part of TFT. Data checking them is really good, but the first tip I would say when picking augments is to generalize and categorize each augment so you know when to pick them. Generally in stage two, the first augment that you see, you want an econ or item augment first, depending if you're winning or lose streaking. Then in stage three or your second augment, you want a combat or item augment in most cases. Then for the last one, you generally want combat unless you're going for a very specific strategy. Of course, there are exceptions to this generalization, unless of course you're a Twitter user and everything must be taken literally. Also, data only works for my arguments. You can't use them in yours. So head on over to teamfight.lol slash stats slash augments for the best augments at each stage. Next tip we have is beggars can be choosers. I wanted to make a dating joke here, but that would be pretty offensive. But this augment is great for forcing a certain comp if they are augment dependent. You can also be a little sneaky with this. It's best on portals where you know an augment rarity can appear so that you can manipulate them easier. For example, if you're on prismatic finale, you could play around a certain prismatic augment on stage four and take beggars can be choosers at the very start. Other than that, you kind of have to compare this augment to other gold augments, such as AFK, which gives 18 gold or placebo, which gives eight. That's one way to kind of evaluate this. Another silver augment, find your center is great for comps that revolve around one champion and often great in portals, which give fewer resources. Same for long distance pals. This is great for a two comp champ instead, but again, also great for low resource portals. So if you're running like the champion augments where you really only care about, let's say you're like Nunu, both these augments would do very well in those comps. Patience is a virtue. That's probably one of my sayings too. But if you want to buy something in your shop, when you take this augment, you can always lock it and buy it in the next round, which loses one reroll, but gains you two because of the augment. So it's a net gain of one. Keep in mind, rerolls also stay forever now, and there's a little counter by your reroll button which shows you how many rerolls you have banked up. A golden quest, level up, birthday present, transfiguration, and many other intensive augments sound very fun, uh, but they're best taken on high economy portals. Unfortunately, all of these sound really cool. It's like a fantasy trope in a game by getting a lot of money to do stuff with. But oftentimes, having fun is not the best way to win, so only pick these when it's actually the right time to use them. Next up is Frosty Frontline, which gives you an Eternal Winter and a Revive. This makes it great to combine with a solo tank with Gargoyle Stoneplate. There are some patches where Eternal Winter or Gargoyle Stoneplate are both bad items, but if they are ever good, you definitely want to combo these together. Metabolic Accelerator has existed for a long time, but people, including me, still forget that they have it and accidentally pick the wrong item on Carousel. Be very careful when taking this, just remind yourself at the start of every carousel that you have metabolic accelerator. Little Buddies is great, but many people don't know when it's worth it to use. So you should generally use Little Buddies in vertical comps because those play a lot of one and two cost units because you're just picking every unit in a trait. But you should always play at least two one or two cost units, but preferably three or four to make the most use out of this augment. Anything more than that might make your team a little too weak. So don't go too overboard on little buddies as well. High voltage is quite interesting as an augment because it gives your ionic sparks plus three range, which gives them five range essentially. So what you can do is you could use high voltage in the front line and hit everyone, but sometimes they die. So in other cases, if you really need the effect of it, you could always put it on a backliner so that the user remains alive for a bit longer if you really need the magic shred in some comps. Next up we have is trait tracker. Pretty much only take this augment on a wandering sentinel portal or if you could activate it almost right away. The augment is literally balanced around this, so taking it in other scenarios is just putting yourself at a disadvantage. Call to Chaos, while this augment seems very fun, only take it if you're willing to flex a bit or if you are more desperate than a 5-5 guy on Tinder. The reward is generally good expected value compared to other prismatics though. Crash Test Dummies is one of my favorite augments, but there is a little trick to this. Sometimes when you put the Crash Test Dummies right next to each other, they might jump and go to the back line for some reason. Doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, you pretty much auto win the those fights. Next, I want to talk about golems and target dummies or even temporary copies of champions. These are always best to use as tanks and get targeted first. 
so make sure to put these units on the edge whenever you get them. Too Tanky is a great augment and very fun. It's also a remake of Twin Terror from before, except now it only gives tanky stats. This means you do not need to play duplicates of your backline units like you did in the past. Now of course it's never wrong to give more health to your team, but oftentimes you could use those extra unit slots to activate key synergies. Now for intermediate tips. If you are a dirty reroller, use your brain for 5 seconds and do not roll on the PvE round because the units can drop from the orb if you are 1 or 2 off. If you run an area of effect comp, burn and wound effects are almost mandatory so that you don't waste that damage. Single target comps, burn and wound effects are not as important in, but still useful. So whenever you are in the late game and you don't have a burn effect yet, and you're on the item carousel, think to yourself first whether you really need it. If you're feeling a little extra, you could even scout the teams you're about to play and see if they have big healing on their team. Did you know that they changed the way mana works in TFT? Now units are able to stack mana to apply to their next cast, making Shoujin much more playable. Now there's always a big mana question, blue buff or Shoujin? But now the answer is a bit easier. Typically, you want blue buff on low mana units and Shoujin on high mana units. I'd say the breakpoint is about at 40 mana. However, blue buff is better suited for damage dealers and Shoujin is more so for utility carries. So if it's going to be a close call, if your unit has 40 or 45 mana, use that rule instead. Don't agree with the last opinion? Well, if you also want to make TFT guides, I suggest using the team builder on teamfight.lol. I found in terms of usability, it's a lot more friendly than other team builders. For example, some of the popular ones out there, you can't even type in a trait like Eldritch and instead it only looks up champion names. So that's one of the many reasons why I really like this. There's also a really handy screenshot features, being able to three star units as most people would expect. But there's also things like adding in mandatory items and denoting them as such, such as putting the Spear Shoujin on Syndra, right clicking and adding it as core, and it kind of highlights the item. The screenshot feature is great because it makes it so you don't have to like manually crop your photos every time and all the dimensions get messed up. This team builder is essentially built with the purpose of making content creation a lot easier. Those are just the many features of this team builder. Now let's talk about emblems. Some emblems do some stuff for your team, some emblems do some things for the unit. So you need to make sure you know what your emblem actually does. If it's a team wide trait, put the emblem on a unit that you don't really care about. However, if it's an emblem that you could use on a carry unit, make sure you put it on a carry. Sounds pretty straightforward, but a lot of people don't don't do this. For example, portal gives you a shield and enhances your portal. So you mainly care about the portal whenever you go deeper into the portal trait. So you could just put portal emblem on some off tank or someone in the front. You wouldn't put it on a backliner, for example, because the shield doesn't make too much sense on them. Blaster, on the other hand, gives a big buff. So you actually want to put it on a unit that will make use of it. Now let's talk about champions. Jax has an area of effect ability, which means you want to put him on the edge of your tank line. Jace starts as a range unit before transforming into a melee. So even though he's a shapeshifter, don't put him in the the front line quite yet like how other people have been doing. Put him in the second, third, or fourth row because he gains resistances after casting so you don't want him in the front line taking damage without his extra resistances before transforming into his tank version. Now let's talk about the two Bastions at one cost. Both of them have AoE abilities so a two star Lilia makes a great solo front line in stage two especially if you combine it with a Gargoyle stone plate and Bastion gives you resistances early on in a fight. This makes two star Lilia an especially good combo if you don't have many other tanks on your team. Now, instead of Hwak Tu, it's Achu. Namzi's Fiery Sneeze will wound and burn units if Dragon is activated, making it a great utility unit if you want to splash it in later on if you're playing Smolder. Okay, this was not the best tip. Uh, I really just wanted to include like the Hwak Tu meme somewhere, and this is the only place I could kind of fit it in. My bad. The best use of Seraphine requires scouting, as you'll need to line up the most enemies to be hit by her ability. Normally, you could default Seraphine's positioning to a corner, but sometimes you can get better angles if you scout. Twitch is a great splash unit, it for the Sunder effect if you do physical damage. Warwick is not a hunter, oddly enough. He's also a vanguard that does not have a shielding ability. Instead, he stacks his attack speed per champion killed, meaning if you want to run him as a carry, you'll need to do it very, very early. Zoe does not have magic shred, but she does reduce flat magic resistances, so she is still useful for any AP comp. Ari gains a big benefit from AP, so if you do decide to carry her, a Rabadon's death cap is extremely useful. Cassiopeia's ability works really, really well with the encanter trait, so make sure you get a ton of rage blades on her and get a ton of stacks. Put important units near your Kog'Maw whenever 
whenever you're running him, since his slippery goo gives attack speed to units hit by his ability. Galio always stuns the furthest enemy within three hexes, meaning you could target stun him if you scout. This is especially useful against melee carries. Nyla loves shields if you read her, so if you don't, get her a bloodthirster. Perhaps you could even try some builds with Locket if you get it. Place Nunu in the front of melee carries as he will tell them to chill out. Syndra stacks her abilities, so if you ever get an early Syndra 2 star, you can slap a Shoujin Nashers on her and use her as her carry for the rest of the game, although 3 star is best in these cases. And she even has built in magic resist shredding, so you can focus purely on damage whenever you're building her. Trisana works really well with the assassin charm because she can jump to the backline and stun enemy carries or kill them. Bard may work as a carry, but he's naturally a support unit as he gives damage amp to enemies hit by his ability, which makes him a great splash unit, and he's also a 3 trait unit. Ezreal hits so many units, so you really want red buff on him. Huey gets a bonus on every third cast. Pop quiz, which emblem would work really well with that? The answer is Mage Emblem. Coincidentally, Huey also uses AP. Jinx is a reset champion, so you want to put all your damage dealers near her so that she can focus fire. Also, you should scout around every fight to find the weaker frontliners on the enemy teams to target first, and if you're trying to counter Jinx, put a big solo frontline right in front of her. Katarina is another reset champion, and while I have not tried it yet, putting Pyro on Jinx or Katarina would probably be a good idea since they have an execute effect. This also makes items like Collector interesting on them due to the execute. Mordekaiser loves long fights, just like in the bedroom. Make sure he lasts long enough to actually get that benefit. Nico is a utility tank. While still useful with items, it's best to reserve your main tank items for someone else. Vagar benefits from more charms, so it takes three shops to see a charm, and you could only get one charm for a round. So whenever you're playing Vagar, make sure to start rolling for charms as early as possible without griefing your entire econ. To do this, get a consistent econ augment to be able to afford seeing three shops each round, and also try to prioritize the econ charms so that you can keep buying them over and over. Vex is an independent tank who doesn't need any other tank. She loves to be a solo frontliner due to her ability, which works in a similar fashion to Gargoyle Stoneplate, so that's also a very good item on her. Fiora is a secondary carry in most cases, so always make sure you duo carry whenever you play Fiora. Essentially, there are just better damage dealers out there, but that doesn't mean she shouldn't be itemized, it's just that she can't solo carry. Use her in games where you have lots of items to spread around. Gwen gains a snip stack for every two casts. You already know what I'm gonna say, Mage Emblem is very interesting on her. Just like a Toxic X, Kalista loves ripping people's hearts out, in TFT she does this in multiple units at a time, and since she is a pseudo AoE champ, it makes Runons very good on her. Typically, Runons always works really well on those style of champions, as they can kill the multiple units a bit faster. Karma is a stall champion of set 12. She'll work great with Morello plus blue buff, as her ability spreads Morello faster than STDs at the Olympic Village. Rakan will be a great flex tank, as he works well in the late game with Morgana as a preserver, and preserver is just a great support trait in general. You probably don't even need to itemize Rakan and can prioritize your main tank instead. Tarek attracts enemy projectiles, so make sure to scout and put him in front of the key enemies. Varus's ability range is based on his auto attack range, which means increasing it has great value through something like an RFC. Milio gives items to your team, but did you know that there are also rules for this? Milio prioritizes units with items already on them, so make sure you slap a random item on your tertiary or quaternary carry so that Milio targets them. Smolder is a dumbass who loves running around throughout the fight and loves running close to the enemies, even though Smolder's essentially an ADC like in League of Legends. However, this does not mean Smolder is bad, it just means he needs some survivability from either Augments or items, so make sure you put like a Hextech Gunblade on him or use 3 Dragon where Smolder heals a bit from his 3 Dragon effect. Zerath is the flex legendary of set 12 that you could use in almost any comp, and he doesn't really have any traits. So if you're ever looking for a random legendary to just throw into your comp, Zerath is the first one that comes to mind. Essentially, throw Shoujin on him. If you're trying to use him as your primary carry, throw some AP as well. If he's a support unit or a secondary carry, throw a Morello on him or a red buff as it'll debuff a lot of units on the enemy team. Yumi dies when Nora dies, so make sure whenever you're playing Nora, keep Nora safe because Yumi's buff is actually pretty big. Briar Snack should almost always be eaten if she's 2 star or if you plan on itemizing her because she gets stronger based on your missing health. Also, do not eat if it costs you a life threshold. For example, uh, people often estimate like 10 to 15 life per loss. So if you're at like 16 life, 
probably don't eat a snack because that could put you in kill range. Whereas oftentimes you'll live with like one or two health if you're at 16. Now I want to close out the video with three advanced tips. The first one deals with itemization and augment picking, and that is to not go overboard on one stat unless a unit only benefits from that one stat. For example, if you think about resistances when itemizing a tank, if you're playing bastions, bastions already get a ton of resistances from their trait, so putting something like a stone plate on them is not that effective, even though it's still good. What would be even better is to increase what's called their effective HP and that's to give them health instead. So for example, you might want Warmogs on some of your Bastions, so that way you get a lot more health for the free resistances that you get from their traits. This also works for damage dealers too. If you're itemizing a Rise, you don't really need Spear Shojin on him because he already gets mana regeneration from the Scholar trait, which essentially has the same effect as Shojin. Instead, you want to build stuff like Rage Blade on him so that he casts faster and makes use of the Scholar effect, and then give him ability power to deal a bunch of damage. Then with ability power, you don't want to just throw two Rabadon's Death capped on him. While it still might be a Effective, it's not the most effective thing to do because again you're only over stacking one stat instead mix it up a little bit by adding things like a jeweled gauntlet to give him critical strike chance or like a giant slayer to give him some damage amplification there are exceptions to this rule for example deja vu galio loves having a rage blade and you build two rage blades on him but that's only because every time he attacks he gains mana and he gains ability power so that way giving him more attack speed effectively also gives him more ability power the second advanced tip is what's considered best in slot in general might not be best in slot for your specific game. TFT sometimes comes down to countering people, especially when you're fighting for top two or top one. And sometimes you have to take the item that's best in the duel you have against the other player, not necessarily what's best in general. It requires scouting and it's gonna be different based on everyone's situation, but it's just something to consider when you're taking an item off of Carousel, for example. Lastly, we actually have 102 tips for you. So I guess I clickbaited you into the video because we're giving you extra. So if you are lazy at positioning and and you don't want to scout every turn, what you can do instead is when you're AFK waiting for your turn to end, just swap your units randomly in the back row so that people who are scouting you don't know where they'll end up. It essentially creates a 50-50, but it definitely isn't optimal because you should try to actually scout every turn, but if you're lazy, it's one of those easy ways out. Well, that's going to wrap it up for me today. Hopefully you all enjoyed these 102 tips. Let me know which one was your favorite. If you want to share some tips with other players, head on over to the Discord. The link is somewhere in the description below. But apart from that, that is all for me today. I hope to see you all next time.